Welcome back. Video 5, Chapter 1, Origins. We're going to start with the Palette of Narmer. This is one of the artifacts that are left behind that we consider artwork from that ancient Egyptian time. The Narmer Palette um, is an Egyptian ceremonial engraving. It's a little over two feet tall and it's shaped like a chevron shield. It depicts that first dynasty, King Narmer, conquering his enemies and uniting Upper and Lower Egypt. It features some of the earliest hieroglyphics that are found in Egypt. The palette is carved out of a single piece of siltstone, commonly used for ceremonial tablets in the first dynastic period of Egypt. The fact that the palette is carved on both sides means that it was created for ceremonial instead of practical purposes. Palettes were, which were made for daily use were only decorated on one side. The Narmer palettes intricately carved to tell the story of King Narmer's victory in battle and the approval of the gods at the unification of Egypt. Some of the, it has some of the world's oldest hieroglyphic and um, horns in that upper section represent the goddess Hathor. Hawk, the hawk represents the god Horus, who is symbolic of the living Pharaoh in the tall headpiece. This is um, from the tomb of Nebamun, Nebamun, sorry. This is called Nebamun Hunting Birds. This is a fresco on dry plaster. And so um, if you look, you see, you know, this was on a wall. And while the plaster was wet, um, or when the plaster was dry, then they would um, do this painting. Um, it's about two feet, eight inches tall. Notice the, we've come a long way from the cave paintings. When we take a look at this, you see a lot more intricate design, details, colorations. Um, beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork. We've come a long way from those caves. Akhenaten um, abandoned the Egyptian pantheon of gods. Remember, he's the one that established that monotheistic religion that worshipped the sun disc god Aten and declared himself to be the one direct connection between humans and Aten. He also changed the artistic style to show realism, like a sunken chest, a pot belly, thin arms and legs. Um, he ruled for 17 years with his wife the famous, beautiful Nefertiti. At his death, Egypt returned to polytheism so under the rule of his young successor and possibly his son, younger brother or stepson. The lineage is kind of unclear. Um, and the, the, the person who's the next ruler is going to be Tutankhamun. Um, so here you have that depiction <clears throat> in limestone of... Akhenaten and Nefertiti and their children worshiping the sun god, god Aten. So, you know, he worked for monotheism and then King Tut put it back to polytheism, so it didn't last long. Um, this is an ancient Greek love poem excerpts. I love you through the daytimes, in the dark, through all the long divisions of the night, those hours I I spendthrift, wasted away alone, and lie and turn awake till white and dawn. For God's sake, sweet man, it's coming at you, my tunic loose at the shoulder. So there you get a little, little, little dabble into love poems. This famous piece is part of a gray and pink granite diorite steel, steel bearing priestly decree concerning Lotomy the Fourth in three blocks of text. This is the Rosetta Stone. Um, the Greek text, this contained, contained hieroglyphics, 14 lines, Demotic, 33, 32 lines, and Greek, 54 lines, okay? Each text reveals the same information, but in a different language. The Greek text allowed the researchers to translate the Egyptian hieroglyphics for the first time. So this is, it kind of like broke the code on language um, and helped them decipher language. This is broken off, a broken off part of a bigger stone slab. 
it has a message carved into it it's written in those three types of writing or script it was an important clue that helped experts learn to read um, so this became the code breaker for language it's not a surprise that language programs today are called rosetta stone okay because you're trying to decode and learn a new language all right so uh, another thing that we made reference to before is the book of the dead all right this was a funerary pap papyrus. It's a collection of funerary prayers that illustrates the last judgment. So from left above, you have Hunifer, who kneels in adoration before a company of deities who are named Ra, Adam, Shu, Tenfet, Geb, Nut, Horus, Isis, all the different gods and goddesses, okay? Um, on the left scale pan is his heart. On the right is a feather hieroglyphic, which symbolizes Mot. Um, below the balance crouches Amit, the devourer of the damned. So you've got all of these different things. Basically, simplistically, when you think of that book of the dead, it is about how to go from um, your resurrection and into how you make that journey into the afterlife. All right, so Great Pyramids of Giza. This is in Giza, Egypt. This is an example of monumentary, monumental mortuary architecture. So Egypt's pharaohs ex were expected to become gods in the afterlife. So to prepare for the next world, they would have temples erected to the gods and massive pyramid tombs for created for themselves and in these tombs would it would be filled with all the things each ruler might need to guide and sustain himself in the world so there would be food there would be um, treasures there would be clothing there would be all kinds of things all right now the you see all three pyramids okay the the three major pyramids that we have remaining all three of these giza's fame pyramids and their elaborate burial complexes were built during a frenetic period of construction where they were doing tons of construction quickly um the pyramids were built by pharaoh's hufa which is the tallest kafiri which is the one in the background and medkari which is in the front they were built to endure an eternity and they have done just that. The monumental tombs are relics of Egypt's old kingdom era and were constructed some 4,500 years ago. Egypt's pharaohs, again, expected to become kings in the afterlife. Now, the Sphinx stands as a sentinel for the pharaoh's entire tomb complex. Um, so here's a picture of the famous Great Sphinx of Giza. This depicts the face of a king of uh, of a king Khafre on a lion's body. Okay, this is solid limestone. It's a monolith, meaning it's one huge piece of stone. Now here's another structure. This is the Senmut. This is a funerary or a mortuary temple of Queen Hatshepsut. So you see, look at the people, and you see the size of the people next to this structure. Notice we're seeing columns. We're seeing all kinds of interesting things. You've got those big tall steps like we saw in the ziggurats. This is the temple of Amen Mutskonsa. This is in Luxor, Egypt. Its construction was under Amenhotep III, um, and it was completed under Ramses II. So this was an ongoing process. This is the temple of Ramses II. Now notice you've got these very interesting sitting kind of uh, sculptures, all right? Notice it's like the, the legs don't seem proportionate to the rest of the body. They're thicker, they're, but you've got these interesting sitting um, structures. Here you've got Chifan seated. This is a colossal statue of a pharaoh. This is, um, you've got it, uh, it's from granodorite is the is the actual uh, material that you use. Again, you've got that seating seated position, and he's sitting on a throne type thing. And you've got all the hieroglyphics. This is a very famous piece. This is King Menunakara, my Cyrenus, and his queen. Now, notice the two figures stand side by side. Um, 
gazing into eternity together. He represents the epitome of kingship in the ideal human male form, and she's the ideal female. Now notice she is a step behind him. Here you've got a famous piece, scribe cross, sitting cross-legged. Um, this is limestone with, there's actually rock crystal eyes, and this is at the museum, the Louvre Museum in Paris. Here you've got an interesting um, metal and glass pyramid, and this is the entrance. This is how you enter the um, Louvre Museum in Paris. Um, if you saw the movie um, Da Vinci Code or Angels and Demons, one of those films, they, they actually had this as part of the setting. All right, so then that brings us to Africa. While things are going on in Egypt and in um, other locations, you've got things happening in the Western Sudan. We get terracotta sculptures from this Western Sudan civilization. The first evidence of realistic portraiture in African art. In the Americas, in early America, civilizations formed mosaic of migrant culture. So you had in Peru, pyramids were in Peru, um, the birthplace of the New World Civilization. You had the Almec, which were the rubber people. Um, they would have colossal hit stone heads, uh, monuments that were pyramids. Beyond the West, in India, we had things like the Bronze Age that was going on there. Remember how we talked about in Lecture 1 that people were... Um, progressing in their civilizations and developments but at different paces. Written language, sculptural tradition. In ancient India you had some of the oldest devotional texts, the blending of ancient religions. Um, you had a caste system. In Also in India you had Hindu pantheism, the belief that divinity inheres in all things. Um, you also had the Dharma, the right conduct, that idea of Nirvana, which was a reunion of the Brahman and Atman. Nirvana was this condition that uh, achieving Nirvana was the ultimate. Um, there was karma, the idea of rebirth in Nirvana as well. You've got in China, the Shang Dynasty, rulers are considered intermediaries between the people in the spirit world. You've got the dragon imagery. You've got the aristocracy of merit, the first system in which individuals selected for government on the basis of their merit in education. So the educational system is improving. In ancient China, this idea of the yin and yang, the positive and the negative, and the need for the balance. There's a Chinese belief in an inviolable natural order. You've got Taoism in Chinese, the philosophy of the way. It was the most profound expression of uh, the natural order. It requires simplicity, harmony with nature. So again, you know, that, that Chinese culture is assimilating and creating wonderful things. What's the significance of the years of early civilizations? What do we learn from these years in history? What is important about what is left behind by those generations? Well, those are all questions that we continue to ask ourselves. Um, we see in looking at these early civilizations some very key things that we see in our civilization. We see the beginnings of so many things and the development of those things. And it just keeps and continues through all of these various times. So progress is happening. Development is happening. People are becoming more civilized. People are creating better civilizations. All of these things are important to the future. In our next chapter, we're going to be talking about ancient um, Greece and then eventually traveling to ancient Rome. So you're going to continue to see so many developments. All right, this concludes our last video in the Unit 1 series.